Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas, back to King's Indians land. Um, I uh, have received a fair few feedbacks about the first King's Indian video and uh, that was a very ambitious adventure really because the King's Indian is such a large opening, it's very difficult to meaningfully cover uh, a lot of things in a very short time frame and uh, obviously I did leave uh, certain variations um, out of the, the video but um, I'm trying my best to be as coherent as possible and still uh, present a sizable material. So today on that note we are mostly going to talk about, um, I wouldn't say anti-Kings uh, Kings Indians but non-mainline Kings Indians uh, um, exclusively. And um, here there is an inter interesting uh, concept to mention and that is, is that you can develop your repertoire on the black side of the King's Indian in a million ways against uh, the non-mainline King's Indians. And so to name them so that uh, you can work with me here, I am predominantly talking about the Zamish, the Four Pawn Attack, um, the Averbach, the uh, Fianchetto variation. So these variations in my opinion, and I could add a few and take away a few depending on what structures we're talking about, usually you can sort of mix them together and aim for a similar structure. And I think that it's a very good thing to do. And what I'm going to recommend you here is um, a structure layout that I think works really, really well, reasonably easy to understand and learn. And it's based on understanding much more so than learning individual moves. And that's basically the core of uh, this um, video series. Although I'm a big believer of learning your lines and knowing them. But equally, if not more importantly, it's very important that we understand what's going on. So, long story short, um, the way I used to do it, and this is by no means the only way to go, uh, go about business, is that... Um, against the Zamish, which is uh, identified by an early F3, usually followed by Bishop E3 move, I used to, and I still do, transpose into Ben on it. And this is actually a path that I recommend you to do against uh, many of the previously mentioned variations. The benefit of this is that you become familiar with a different structure, but because of the structure is not only played against the Zamish, but other variations as well, you still develop a very good understanding about what to do in those variations. And so, here I present you um, the uh, one and only C5, D5, E6, Queen D2, E D, C D, landing us right away in mainline Benoni. There is a very strong uh, correlation between King's Indian and Benoni, occasionally even between King's Indian and Benku, quite uh, uniquely. You can also make a transition there against various lines, very rarely some Dutch, but mostly it's uh, King's Indian and Benoni, they walk hand in hand um, depending on how you develop your repertoire. Just so that you understand what I'm talking about, the main line Benoni looks um, like this c5 d5 e d c d g6 e4 d6 f3 bishop g7 bishop e3 castles queen d2 and we are in the modern benoni of course white has a million variations here uh to play other than the zamish setup and in fact the reason why we are happy to enter the benoni setups against the zamish is because against the Benoni, the Zamish is by no means considered to be uh, the, the most dangerous and the most annoying response at all. In fact, it's one of the, uh, the responses that Black enjoys playing against the most out of uh, all choices that White can chuck at the Benoni. And so we need to be aware of that. So we, we don't just transition into blah because why not coconut, but because of what we're transitioning into, in this case, the Benoni, the variation that we land in is actually very respectable from Black's point of view, especially compared to some rather problematic Benoni main lines. So, back to business. Um, F3, C5, D5, E6, takes, takes. And now I need to give you here a little bit of a, a talk about Benoni in general, because the Benoni structure is typically one that you can really well play, really, really well play, by just understanding what you need to play for as far as plans are concerned and you are set 
And so the Benoni structure is identified by this very unique pawn layout of e4, d5 versus uh, d6, uh, c5 for black. And so what that means is that if you, in your head, you cut the board half between the e and d file, then you notice that white has got three queenside pawns versus black's four, and white has got four kingside pawns versus black's three. And so very often the respective plans are revolving around getting those pawns in motion, the majorities to get them in motion and start rolling them up. Um, so the key ideas for black are to play for a6 b5, it generally gets shut down very, very brutally and crudely, and then land a knight on e5. And uh, if we cannot generate enough play on the queen side, then we need to fight for the center by virtue of playing for f5, which often happens by moving the knight. And so this is the core idea uh, behind the Benoni structures. And um, the only thing that you really need to know now is, is that um, there is a very strong and very important relationship between these two knights. And it's very easy to get this wrong unless um oh thank you legend um uh, my dinner has arrived cheese wow um you need to understand this and that is as follows and a lot of people get this wrong and they don't understand why they lose games this knight is the main troublemaker in this system by virtue of benoni system so it has to develop uh on a very awkward squares and uh the best square for this knight is really f2 um, for two reasons a eh? because it covers e4 but it also supports f4 uh, because uh, the knight defends the e4 pawn but from f2 the knight is also denying black's knight g4 jump so in any point if white plays the horrific f4 uh, knight g4 picking off this bishop and the game is over because we just dominate the dark squares so knight on f2 is very very handy uh, against this and so a lot of players is with black in such structures against the Benoni so, uh, Sorry against the Zamish setup uh, They blindly play here knight d7 which is actually largely inaccurate because it allows white to play knight h3 And after knight e5 drop back to f2 now in stark contrast if white plays black plays correctly Sorry and plays a, a useful developing move that usually means that um, white ends up playing the knight to f2 instead of two moves in four. So the knight got to f2 via e2, g3, h1, f2. That's huge, man. That means that we chose not to donate two moves to white. And after f5, this position is an absolute chaos. Really, really fun to play. Um very exciting uh, play because um, the king side center is, is, is still open to ba uh, for battle but uh, the queen side hasn't been entirely sealed either and so there's a lot of room for creativity for shaping uh, the play for both sides a really really fun uh, opening setup this is and once again the most important key thing to note is the relationship between these knights as per described now this comes with a consequence and that is, is that here we cannot play knight d7, or rather I should say we shouldn't, because of knight h3, c5, d5, knight e5, knight f2, e6, and we landed in that variation that I showed you with two tempos down, two tempi down. So the price we have to pay for this is that we want to play c5 instantly, but it's hanging. So unfortunately here we need to learn an opening variation that includes this very, very fun pawn sacrifice. I very highly recommend you to engage with this line because it's a really good endgame in the sense that it's very non-endgame-like. So um, here we are playing for an initiative with black and uh, trying to bruise and hurt uh, white as much as possible. Uh, mostly by jumping on these juicy dark squares, playing a5, knight, b4, and uh, white is struggling to develop and connect the rooks uh, in general. This is something that you need to learn a little bit more move by move rather than just generic ideas, because against different white moves you have to be very accurate. But the idea is there to bring the knight back, bring the knight in, play a5, bring the other knight in, hit the pawn, hit d3, hit c2, and so on.
So you must learn this variation. Uh, the go-to game um, is going to be Kramnik Shirov. Um, and uh, that is going to cover you rather well. And so now we have got the core um, against the non-mainline Kings Indians, which is going to be this modern Benoni setup. By the way, just one more side variation I want to show you. They can choose to maintain the tension instead of pushing in. You play knight c6 and after queen d2 you play e6. And um, once again, um, we have got a beautiful uh, layout where we can go queen a5 and uh, just play very, very natural moves. Here, castles is a main line. I really don't like it for white, to be honest, because it's queen a5, a6, uh, b5 is coming real soon. So usually white opts here to transpose into the main line that I have already shown you with uh, a6, a5 inserted and then h5 and then we are there. So that's your Zaimish. Now, if you choose to do this, which you don't have to, but one of my recommendations, the other thing would be uh, to consider one of the wildest main lines against the Zaimish with uh, knight d7 and then e5 and then c6 and uh, play like Kasparov uh, did many times against... Um, Actually, it's e5, queen d2, c6 first, my bad, and then knight d7. Uh, play like Kasparov did against Karpov, among others. Uh, is a very, very fascinating way to play too. A bit more theoretical and a bit less structury. So it's harder to understand and there is more to learn. So now that we established ourselves on the black side of the Benoni against the Zaimish, in my opinion, it makes perfect sense to do the exact same against the so-called four pawns attack. So now this is how you can see that our opening repertoire is cleverly lined up. That again, we opt for the Zaimi, uh, sorry, for the Benoni setup. Once again, we have the same pawn layout. So definitely modern Benoni. Once again, I'm going to show you that although this occurred via a King's Indian move order, the original move order is the Benoni. So once again, it looks like this. Knight here, c5, d5, e, d, takes, takes, d6. We are in the modern Benoni, e4, g6, f4. And there you have it. So that's the transition we are talking about. It's also very important to know these things because Although this is going out of fashion more and more, but back in the day, knowing the eco code, the encyclopedia of chess opening codes of openings that you played used to be crit critically important because that's how you looked up opening files. That's how chess base still um, orders files. And so when it comes to transitions, you need to be careful because you would think, ah, okay, I'm playing King's Indian, which is uh, in the ecosystem between E60 to E99. And you go to that section of the encyclopedia of chess openings and no F4 uh, King's Indian there. It's because it's a modern Benoni, which you will find from A60 all the way up to A80, because from there it's Dutch. Uh, I used to know the whole lot, but now that I'm not really using it anymore, I only remember about 90% of it. Um, yeah, so F4. Um, and again, the strategies are more important than uh, the actual move order, although to some degree you need to be accurate here. So one of the concepts of the modern Benoni is that usually black doesn't mind trading this bishop for this knight. And the reason for that is, is because the pawn structure is such that we are a little bit behind in space. We are a little bit hard pressed for space. And so since we have got less room to work with, if we can trade one pair of pieces, that allows us to execute a perfect piece layout like so, when nobody is trading on anybody else's toes. With the bishop on c8, it just feels a little bit awkward. And now you understand one of the main concepts of the Zaimish setup, by the way, which achieves the fact that this bishop cannot develop to any meaningful squares at all. The price they pay for it is a slightly awkward pawn layout, an awkward development, and just in general, a not so fluid plan on the white side. But now we understand where this whole... Um, F3 shenanigan is going as far as white is concerned. They want to keep every single piece on the board and watch black struggle as they have got a little bit less space. 
nothing major, but that's the concept. Anyway, so we have got this and again here, remember the, the core idea is the piece layout and then you will be fine. You have got a couple of things to keep in mind. You want to play for a6, b5. Almost definitely it's going to be denied by virtue of a simple pawn move a4. You almost always want a rook on e8. This allows you a zillion tactical opportunities and very importantly, we are monitoring the e5 break. Okay, it's super important. Um, last but not least, because of the bishop has departed from this diagonal, we often have a plan of pushing c4, chucking the knight on c5 and coming into d3 or b3. In contrast, white at the same time is trying to deny all of these, sometimes play for g4, g5, sometimes play for e5. It's very important that you understand both sides' plans. Best here is if I model you this with a game. Florin Georgiou, a very famous Romanian GM here is black. Which layout is the best for us? Certainly not this. That, that looks good. It's just a little bit miscut. So let's have a look at how Georgiou does it. It's actually a Benoni move order, but from our point of view, it doesn't matter because we are in the same position. Exact same that I was explaining to you here. Yeah? If minus a6, ah, here we go, a6, a4 inserted. C4, bishop e3, queen a5. Now knight c5 is good to go. Obviously knight c5 here would have been a fatal error because bishop takes pawn takes and then e5. So queen e5, a5, sorry, queen c2, rook e8. All the bricks of the building are perfectly lining up, rook c8, so that now knight c5 can again be taken back without moving the pawn on d6. King h1, a very tentative and unnecessary move. White needed to uh, make a call on what they wanted to do. Maybe g4, maybe rook d1. Uh, something um, more energetic needed to be played. Bishop takes, queen takes. Usually the Benoni is great for black if we land in an endgame. So here, uh, because usually what tends to happen, excuse me, is that this bishop becomes a monster. But also that these move pawns are far more mobile than uh, the four, excuse me, the four white pawns and uh, the pull, pull of e5 is just a lot harder than getting b5, b4 in. That is piece of cake. And so white here avoids the queen trade, but now b5 comes in. They should have played b5 here, no brainer really. Actually, queen b4 is a bit of a, a weak move there. Um, because it actually is in the way of b5, b4, so b5 needed to be played. I can only guess that he didn't want it because of this. And uh, the refutation is breathtaking, and actually this tells you an awful lot about why the Benoni is such an awesome um, opening to feed onto from the King's Indian, because it's brutally tactical, just like the King's Indian. Check this out. What a strike. Wowzers. So the idea is that if rook takes, we take on d2. The knight can't take because we take the bishop, uh, the rook. And if the bishop takes, then we take c3, thus removing the defender of the rook. Wow. Wow, 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 wowie. So not seeing this, I think, is more than acceptable, even from a grandmaster. Especially here. Hence queen b4. A5, knight d7, now the knight is joining the fray. And uh, a tragic blunder ended the game here with rook a4, bishop takes c3. But, to be fair, black's position seems to be far, far easier to play now with incoming knight c5, knight b3, knight d3, and so on. Um, and now we are going to uh, move on to um, another... Um, non-mainline King's Indian where you can use your knowledge of Benoni structures and that is the Fianchetto which causes a lot of headache to a lot of people because again typically a system where you can't attack forget it it's never gonna be a mate no worries that's not happening and so a logical option again for the black players is to play c5 and initiate this variation 
um, which is called the Yugoslav variation. Uh, partly, I guess, because Gligoric, one of the greatest gods of the King's Indian from the 50s, 60s and 70s, uh, played it as black. And when, once again, you see the very typical Benoni patterns that E6 is pending, B5 is coming. The only difference here is that the A5 knight is absolutely atrocious. But it does attack C4, so it does have a benefit. Now, here again, you can rely on your Benoni motifs, but there is an actual variation here that is the main line that I quite like for black. And that is take, take bishop h6, trying to undermine the knight, and then take this, f4, um, is it e6? Wait, I entered it already. Yes, e6 or e5, doesn't matter. Take, take, knight e5, and this exchange sec. Whoopsie daisies, is the key idea. Queen takes bishop g7 back, and again, this bishop is an absolute boss. But interestingly enough, after knight g4, with the idea of attacking the rook and threatening rook knight e3, very often black actually um, doesn't cash in on the exchange that is there for the grab. So here, rook e1, sorry, king h1 is one of the main lines, and here black is usually not taking this. And the reason for that is, is because now the knight is more valuable than the rook. It sort of cuts the board half, it disallows the uh, disjointed pawns to be joined together and so instead bishop d4 enhancing actually this dark square bind is a far more popular choice um, in this position than grabbing the exchange a very very typical play uh, example that uh, mature thinking where you appreciate less value that achieves more then the more value then does nothing. That's probably the clumsiest way to explain an exchange sack. So kudos to me. So again, this variation is something that I wholeheartedly recommend. On top of all of this, uh, Morozevich here played the very curious H5 once against, I can't remember which GM, and scored really well with it actually. Quite a unique idea to try to create this pawn weakness so that when white wants to play F4, this pawn is becoming rather weak. And basically this completes the circle more or less, but I would like to mention one more variation and that is the Avebach, named after the legendary Russian uh, Grandmaster Yuri Avebach, which is uh, these two bishop moves first before the knight comes out. The idea behind the Avebach system is, is that here white uh, sorry, black can't play e5 because take, 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 and knight d5 wins at least an exchange. And black is just dead. And so we need to play a preparatory move like knight a6. Meaning that, just so that we understand, after pass takes, takes, queen takes, rook takes, knight d5 no longer wins because I have rook d6. And the pawn has been defended. That's the point. And so usually they play here queen d2. And after e5, d5. And this reveals the point of the uh, the um, other back system, or at least one point of it. And that is, is that now black can't dislodge this pin. And so the standard plan of moving the knight and playing for f5 has been a little bit uh, fiddled with. Um, nothing wrong with this variation. In fact, I play it as black. This is my go-to. But what I'm suggesting is that once again, you can wholeheartedly consider transitioning into the Benoni, because why not? In fact, you can play c5, d5, h6 first, and then e6 as well, although there is a line here where black goes back to f4, but um, bold and brave players, like everyone who plays the King's Indian for the record, uh, figured out that e6 was even here playable. I'm going to model you this pawn sack again for the second time. Kasparov plays as black against... Uh, the mighty Polugayevsky. What happened here? Oh, e5. E5, knight d7, knight d4 takes, queen takes. Knight takes e5, exclaim. Bishop takes, queen takes, takes, takes. Rook c1, rook d8, b3 takes, takes. Rook d2 was uh, Polugayevsky Kasparov um, drawn in the end. You don't need to remember all of this unless you want to enter this very variation, but there is a way to avoid it, and that is to play h6, bishop e3, and then c5, instead of c5 and then h6. Now we sacrifice the pawn on c5, 
but takes actually uh, is strongly met by queen a5 when we attack this as well as this. So we are going to regain the pawn and enter a favorable morality bind. And when I say favorable compared to the mainline morality binds where the knight is already here and the bishop is here. So black is fine here, which means that again, likely they will play d5. And now we are going to play a weird uh, bet on it when they take back with the e pawn. Now, Soviet grandmasters in the 50s and the 60s made an absolute living out of this variation. They analyzed it to death. They really, really understood well um, what they needed to do to, to win these games. Paul Gajewski, Averbach himself, um, and a few others really, uh, Petrosian himself, to uh, thrived on this. But later on, uh, the players who played this on the black side, including Fischer, figured out that the key to play this successfully is to trade again at least one pair of pieces. And it's usually achieved by bishop f5, knight e4. Or, and that's h3 designed against, by the way, because then g4 is possible. Or rook e8 and then knight e4. Or even here, bishop f5. And um, yeah, now g4 is, is no good because knight e4 incoming. Actually, what's wrong with bishop f5, g4, knight e4 here? Oh, I'm being a clown. Take, take, f3, traps the bishop. That's exactly it. So hence, knight here first. And now we are all good to go. We trade one pair of pieces off. And we are fine and dandy. So, this is my recommendation for chapter 2 in the videos and for understanding your King's India chapter 2. So, in your head, this is a chapter 2, hopefully too. This is basically the side branch of the Benoni structures I recommend against non-main lines. So, this is applicable to Zamish, four point attack, some degree to the Fianchetto variation and even the other Bach. So this is uh, the, the bunch that I, I recommend that you put together because this way you are going to play a, a generic structure and although it does require you to know opening lines and variations, but when you understand the structure, it's far more likely that you will remember and understand your moves at the same time and uh, play the opening very, very well. So I hope that this was uh, helpful, guys. And uh, on that note, I will sign out now and we'll be back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.